I invite you to imagine a different Rosh Hashanah morning, not so long ago or far away as it might seem, a sanctuary packed with worshipers, not our sanctuary, but one much larger, four, maybe 5,000 people, the back rows nearly a quarter mile from the Bima. Scant light shines through the narrow stained glass windows set deep into the side of the building so that one's eye is drawn inexorably toward the brighter lights in the front and the tall, thin rabbi standing on an even taller bima. A young boy, maybe eight years old, fidgets with the clip-on tie that sits on the too tight collar of an unfamiliar shirt then slips out of his parents' seats in the sixth row of the balcony and starts down the aisle stairs. Two rows down, he turns briefly to look back, sees his father in a dark suit, crisp white shirt, deep red tie, gazing down at his prayer book, still and impassive. His mother gives a slight nod and the boy continues to the balcony railing and looks down craning over the edge in an attempt to spot the seats far below where his family sits on ordinary Shabbatot, seats now occupied by the people whose names have become familiar over the years from the plaques on the back of the pew, but whose faces remain obscured by the distance. Just then, the Chazan's voice breaks through the quiet murmur of the crowd, his rich Eastern European accent reinforced by a large choir his voice surges, alternately begging for mercy and seething with rage. Our boy is still too young to know much about the horrors that lay behind the mournful notes, what it must have taken for that mysterious, small but powerful man on the bima to have survived what so many others did not. But he senses that there is something in this man that comes to life in this moment, at once glorious and terrible. The boy closes his eyes as the Chazan sings. Erosh Hashanai Katevun Uvyom Tzom Kippur Yechatemun Then the rabbi's clear stentorian voice picks up the theme. On Rosh Hashanah, the decree is inscribed, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. How many shall pass away, and how many shall be born? Who shall live, and who shall die? Who shall perish by fire, and who by water? Who by sword, and who by beast? Who by hunger, and who by thirst? Who by earthquake, and who by plague? As a child, I believed this literally. There we sat in our scratchy suits and uncomfortable leather shoes while God ran down a list making decisions about each of us, the actual individual people in that room, whether we would live to see another year. On the night between the two days of Rosh Hashanah, going to bed late after Kol Nidre, I could see it in my mind a gigantic disembodied hand writing tirelessly, endlessly, name after name in neat columns in an enormous gleaming white book, while just to the side, equally large but ever more terrible, sat a second book, frayed and worn, bound in a shade of black that seemed to absorb all the light and even the very air around it. Who shall live? and who shall die. And each year I shivered a little as I wondered where my name would end up. Somewhere along the way, I stopped believing literally in the words of Unatana Tokef, the generally accepted premise of this central high holiday prayer that the righteous get sealed in the book of life while the wicked are left out, that the three pathways of tshuva, tefillah, and staka, repentance, prayer, and righteousness will save us, becomes almost impossible to sustain once you get a good look at the world we actually live in. 
Plenty of good people suffer while others get away with all manner of abuse and wrongdoing, often even prospering by their crimes. Children die. Natural disasters wreak havoc. A pandemic sweeps the globe, the virus indifferent to one's moral character. When I consider what we can actually observe about the world, I can't bear to think about God picking and choosing, writing some of our names in one book, and some names in the other. This year, more than any in recent memory, my mind has been drawn back to Unatana Tokef, who by fire in California and Oregon, who by water in Alabama and Florida, who by sword not only in far off wars, but also the blood of black Americans spilled by police and the 1,500 victims of gun violence in our city alone so far this year. And, as if we could forget, who by plague? What are we to make of this prayer in a year when death circles ever closer, the virus taking some and sparing others and leaving yet more of us to wonder if, when, who will it visit next? As these questions fill my head, I see that while I let go of my literal childhood reading of the prayer, the awful vision of God surveying the congregation and selecting names for a book of death, I left the most important work unfinished. If I won't believe that God separates us all into two neat stacks, the worthy and the unworthy life and death, if I can't square that image with the reality I see in the world around us, what, then, do I mean when I sing along to this prayer? So much loss all around us. The toll of human lives is staggering in its immensity, so much so that I can hardly bear to see the numbers in the newspaper. And each of those lives lost was an entire world. Many who have been spared death itself face the burdens of financial strain and unemployment. And the rest of us, those who have thus far escaped direct harm from the pandemic, fall within what grief expert David Kessler calls the worried well, physically and financially healthy, but still burdened by dimensions of loss that ripple like waves in a pond. To lose a loved one, then to be unable to attend the funeral out of state, prevented from sitting shiva with family. Who could have imagined such a state of affairs? A summer full of weddings, rescheduled without any assurance that the new dates will hold. B'nai Mitzvah families struggling to choose how to mark such an important transition in their child's life when the traditional synagogue service is unavailable and the possibilities, Zoom, a tiny in-person service without beloved family members unable to travel, postponing for a year and still left to wonder what will be then, none of these options are actually good. And I have a three-month-old daughter named for my late father, whom my mother has never held, never seen with her own eyes. How many shall pass away and how many shall be born? Who shall live and who shall die? Who shall perish by fire and who by water? Who by earthquake and who by plague? The pandemic reveals something that was always true but is now more visible. All of these terrible things surround us, lurking around corners every day, waiting to pounce. A world like this offers us three paths through life. Fear might dominate our lives. At other times, we may suppress the fear in order to get through the day. Or we can stare into the fear, see it in all its horror, and live anyway, despite the fear. But only one of these things can actually truly be considered living. Each of us will face moments where life's, the enormity of life's uncertainty overwhelms us. That's natural, inevitable. But to live in fear would mean surrendering today's gifts, joys,
pleasures and wonders to a future that is merely one possibility out of many, whose demons may never arrive. To live in constant fear is no life at all. We could choose to push the fear away. In America, at least, I believe this is probably the most popular option. Yes, we can simply make the fear go away. We can numb it out of existence. Humans have shown remarkable ingenuity in finding ways to do this. The catch, however, is that when we push away fear, anxiety, and shame, with them go joy, wonder, gratitude, and compassion. We can turn the fear off, but please, I pray, don't. Unatana Tokev leads us down the one remaining path, the only viable option for life, to look directly at the fear, to see all that could befall us and insist on living every moment to the fullest, despite the fear. How else could we bring a child into this world knowing they will suffer decades of heartbreak, loss, grief, suffering, only to die themselves in the end? Why would we let ourselves fall in love with other human beings, with the pets that have gotten so many of us through COVID, knowing that our love will inevitably bring us the most painful grief of all? And yet, as a species, we insist on doing these very things, falling in love, raising families, teaching children, building businesses, tending to the sick of body, mind, spirit, soul, we know that it will all lead to death in the end, and yet we persist because life also brings love, joy, comfort, beauty, delight. And once I know the fear, accept the unalterable truth that my time will come, and I don't get to know how long I have, and when it comes, it will almost certainly feel too soon when we accept that truth, we become free to soak in every cloud and every star, every sunny day and every drop of nourishing rain, all the joy and love and wonder that life can bring. The fear never goes away. It's just that these other things we get to feel along with the fear sweeten the deal. As Una Tanatokev says, Ma'avirin et roa hagzeira, they cause the bitterness of our fate to pass. They are the spoonful of sugar that lets us swallow the bitter pill of mortality. In acknowledging death, in accepting that the end is the same for us and for everyone we love, we get to live in the meantime. What I find most frightening is not that I will die, I know I most certainly will, but that I can't know, will never truly know until the time comes, when. Who in their time and who before, Unatana Tokev asks. Viktor Frankl, reflecting on his experiences in Nazi concentration camps, observes that an open-ended fate can bring worse suffering than one with a bounded term, no matter how much harsher the latter might be. There are times when I think that if someone could tell me that this pandemic would go on for another 10 years but guarantee a date that it would be over, that I might prefer that horrible certainty over the more likely scenario that it lasts for another year or two, but all the while I won't know how much longer it will be. Then I remember that there can be no guarantees. Uncertainty is the definition of life itself. We never really know, do we? Not just when or how we will die. The parts of life that matter most are all shot through with profound uncertainty. When will I find love? Will my business succeed? Will I be blessed with children, grandchildren? How long will I have with them? What will their lives bring? We will die, every single one of us. And as much as it pains me to think about, the reality is that some of us won't be back next Rosh Hashanah. It breaks my heart to say that even as I know it must be true. 
None of us are guaranteed another day. And even if most of us have the privilege of living day to day without thinking too hard about that fact, on this day we can't avoid it. The angels in heaven are dismayed and are seized with fear and trembling. If the immortal beings tremble on this day, how much more so for us? A person's origin is dust and they return to the dust. Today, there can be no illusions. Life is finite. In the words of poet Mary Oliver, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? The end will come for all of us, and no matter when, it will almost certainly feel too soon. That much is beyond our ability to change. On Rosh Hashanah, the decree is inscribed, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. How many shall pass away, and how many shall be born? Who shall live, and who shall die? Here's the thing I only noticed this year. Unatana Tokef itself never claims that we deserve the degrees handed down, never suggests that we could in any way avoid our fate. The Midrashim on which this prayer is based state explicitly that the righteous go in the book of life and the wicked not so much. But the prayer itself never links life with righteousness. This can only be the author's deliberate omission. I have to imagine that he too looked around the world and saw that our destinies do not follow orderly paths and felt compelled to speak to that truth. Life is not just or fair. It hurts to say it out loud, but we shouldn't ignore what we observe every day. Utashuva, utafila, utsedaka, ma'avirin et roa ha Teshuva, tefila, and sedaka cause the bitterness of our decree to pass. Here, in Unatana Tokef's best-known line, lies perhaps the most consequential change that the author introduced. Midrashim tell us that these three things will cancel our decree. Well, again, we see that simply isn't true. And indeed, when it comes to death, the harshest of decrees, there can be no nullification. Postponement, perhaps, but the end will be the same. No, Unatana Tokef does not offer us any promise of escape. Instead, it tells us ma'avirin et roa hagazera. These three things will help the bitterness of our fate pass us by, help us get through the hardest times. Teshuva, self-reflection, growth, returning to our best selves, deciding in each moment who we want to become. Tefillah, opening our hearts in community, as Suzanne talked about earlier, being together to mark life's passages. Tzedakah, what we give to others, not just money, but time, attention, love, compassion. Most of life is slow, painstaking work. A few steps forward and a few back, a lot of side to side. I think the current pandemic can make it even harder to sense progress when it feels like so much of life is on pause. Unatana Tokef serves as a visceral reminder that time doesn't actually pause. Our days are meted out in unequal measures and it can end with alarming suddenness. Even now, recognizing that Unatana Tokef presents us with a much more nuanced and subtle picture of our fates than I thought as a child, I'm left with the same essential questions. Will it be me this year? Will it be someone I love? None of us get an answer to that question today. Instead, we must live with the only certainty that eventually, the answer to both questions will be yes. The beauty and joy of our lives are built piece by piece by how we live in the meantime. Shana tova umetuka, may it be a year of life, of health, of blessing for all of us.